This last October, I had a profound privilege. I was able to go see my favorite band in the world play in concert. That's right, I saw you two at the Sphere. And this is what it looks like inside the Sphere, inside that big bubble. There it is. That's a picture of what it looks like. It's an LED screen like we have here in the church that encompasses the entire venue. So your entire field of vision is consumed with the screen. And that particular image is the end of the concert. Some of you may know the U2 song, Beautiful Day. That's what they were playing. And all of the animals you see on the screen are endangered species in the state of Nevada. And it was a great, wonderful time. And I was sitting in my seat, and I had, would have to guess, I was about maybe 150 yards from Bono, the singer for U2. Now, on, well, the top of my bucket list is to meet Bono, get a picture with him, me shaking his hand and saying, this is my best pal, Craig. <laughs> that hasn't happened yet. I've been to more U2 shows than I care to admit, and I even had to go to Las Vegas, a city I do not enjoy, to be able to go see U2 this time. Also on that bucket list is I'd like to be able to see a United States president in person. I have not had that opportunity yet. It's on the list. But you know the thing I realize about whether I'm going to see Bono or the president, and believe it or not, Bono is higher on the list than the president, I'm sorry, is that getting close to those kinds of people is next to impossible. You have to have some kind of privilege or influence, or you have to do something in order to get proximity to those people. And in my case, I've never really had a backstage pass. I've never had that kind of access. And so I'm going to have to continue my stalking of Bono in order to get a picture with him one day. Who knows if it'll happen or not. When I hear the story of Jesus' birth in Luke's gospel, I'm struck by who's there to watch it happen. Who has proximity to the greatest, most awesome, amazing human being ever born? Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Well, let's look at who's there. We heard from the scriptures this evening from the gospel of Luke that there were some shepherds there. The shepherds who had been tending their flocks in a field in Bethlehem not far away. This picture that I'll show you right here, this is a picture of Shepherd's Field. There's a church built in Bethlehem that is in honor of this location where the angel was supposed to have appeared to the shepherds that were there. The irony this year, of course, in Bethlehem, as you probably read in the news today, is that there are no gatherings in Bethlehem because of the war that is happening in the Gaza, even though Bethlehem is technically in the West Bank. The Church of the Nativity is holding its worship services, or held them, will be holding them tomorrow morning, to empty churches. The Roman Catholics will come out and read the Mass. Following that, the Orthodox will come out and read through the Divine Liturgy to the Church of the Nativity with no one in it. Bethlehem is deserted. There are no lights, there are no festivities, nothing. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But suffice to say that in this little obscure town of Bethlehem, the angels decided to make an announcement to shepherds. These shepherds in the ancient world were notoriously unreliable. As a matter of fact, if you were giving some kind of testimony as part of a trial or a tribunal and you wanted someone to come be one of your witnesses and you brought in a shepherd, everyone would roll their eyes and chuckle. Shepherds were not to be regarded as trustworthy. They were shady. They were migrant and moving around from place to place. They just simply weren't to be trusted. So it's interesting that the way in which God decides to make this announcement of the birth of Jesus comes to the individuals who are least likely to give a good announcement about that. Shepherds. So if the shepherds were to say, you never guess what happened to us in a field tonight, the heavenly host was open and we saw these angels, people would do what? Eye roll and chuckle. Shepherds were not to be trusted. But yet they're there. 
The text tells us that after Jesus was born, they came and found the infant Jesus with his mother Mary and with Joseph. Well, who else was there? Well, the innkeeper was there probably. Now, usually when we read this story, we think of the innkeeper as being the proprietor of a place like this. In fact, in the ancient world, staying in a motel or a hotel was very dangerous because it signaled to everybody that you were a traveler and that you had possessions with you and you had stuff and you could easily be robbed. And so when Mary and Joseph arrive in Bethlehem, they go to the inn to try to find a room. The Gospel of Luke tells us there was no room in the inn. So the way we all learned this story as children is that Mary and Joseph went from that innkeeper to the Holiday Inn, to the Hilton, to the Motel 6. They couldn't find any place to stay, and so they found a local barn, and they went in there and gave birth to Jesus. What more than likely happened in this world, according to the culture and custom of the day, is that when they went to the innkeeper's door, the innkeeper said, I have no room in the inn. The innkeeper would have taken them into his own home that he would never have let Mary in labor and Joseph stay outside on the street. The innkeeper would have welcomed perfect strangers into his home. And the, she- the uh, innkeeper's home was like many homes of the day. It's like a little Seattle split, two levels. On the upper level is the living quarter of the family. The lower level is where the animals were kept. And there would be a trough cut out of the stone, and that's where the animals would be feeding when the time came for them to do so. So the innkeeper is probably there. Having invited Mary and Joseph into the house, they've gone down to the lower part of the home, given birth to Jesus. She's wrapped him in cloths and laid him in the feeding trough. So you got shepherds, and you have the manager of the Hyatt. Joseph is there. Joseph being an individual of no particular notoriety. He's a carpenter from Bethlehem. He had to return home to Bethlehem to be counted in the census. It's his ancestral home. It's the same hometown of King David, who was born there, give or take, a thousand years earlier. The name Bethlehem, Bethlehem, is Hebrew. Of course, it means house of bread. And so it's out of the house of bread that Jesus, the bread of life, comes forth. That Jesus is born in the very same place that King David was born in a thousand years before. And then finally there's Mary, the mother of Jesus, a woman of no particular significance who comes from a town in Nazareth. At this point in time, she's probably 14 years old. Put that in some context, everyone. She's probably in the eighth grade. And there she is finding herself at the intersection of this great event of the cosmos. That's who's there. No religious experts, no scholars, no civil authorities, no kings, no emperors, no no one. Shady shepherds, the manager of the Hyatt, Joseph and Mary, that's who's there. Now when we read this story, remember we're reading not just about any famous person. This is no Bono, this is no president. This is the one upon whom the entire cosmos turns. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Remember, the announcement to the angels was what? The announcement the angels gave the shepherds is that he's the Savior, so he's going to save us from something, and so we'll get to the something in a minute. He's Christ the Lord, the anointed and the Lord, which is an interesting title because that's the same thing that Caesar Augustus wanted to be called. Christ the Lord. And so, who's the imposter and who's the real thing in the story? Jesus is. Now, he's wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. That's an unusual way to find the Savior of the world, Christ the Lord, but yet the shepherds are told that's how they would find him and that's exactly how they did. The heavens were opened. There was a glorious host of heaven. Glory to God in highest. Peace among all people with whom God is well pleased. You know the story, do you not? This Jesus... This Jesus has not come to save us from empires, but he's come to save us from sin and death. Now, that's a very theological way of describing what Jesus has come to save us from, sin and death. So if I were to ask any of you, how did you experience some sin today? Or how did you experience some death today? Those are harder questions to answer. But if I were to ask you different kinds of questions, like, what kind of pain are you in today? What kind of hurt are you carrying with you right now? 
What relationship in your life today is broken? A relationship maybe with your child? A relationship with your parent? Your spouse? What is it you're carrying around today that weighs your heart down? That's the result of sin and death. It's this that Jesus comes to save us from. And rather than just saving us from the symptom, Jesus has come to save us from the cause. The cause of why we experience that pain, why we carry around the hurt we do in our lives, the suffering that we go through, sometimes day in and day out. Jesus has come to save us from all of that. Jesus even comes to save us from empty Bethlehems. He comes to save the entire cosmos and the world. Everything hinges on this Jesus. The whole cosmos. And who's there? Shepherds? Innkeeper? Mary? Joseph? And friends, this is where I draw hope in the story. Because if shepherds can be there, and innkeepers can be there, and Joseph can be there, and Mary can be there. You can be there. I can be there. This is about a God that is constantly coming to us again and again. There's a reason we repeat all of this ritual every year. Why we sing the carols, we light the candles, We do these things to continually remind ourselves that the God that we long for has already come and keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. Relentless, faithful. We retell this story every year to remind ourselves that in the midst of the pain that we carry, the suffering we endure, the hardships and calamities of life, that there is a God who is coming to us always with love, desiring that we would do nothing more than to accept and receive the gift of God in Jesus Christ. This is God's call, and it never stops. And if all those people can gather around the most famous person to ever be born— Certainly there's room for you and for me. And all we have to do is say, yes, Lord. Yes. Save me. Help me. Give me life. That's it. So would you pray with me? Lord, we pray that this night that you would teach us what is to know you and to fellowship with you and to receive you. We thank you that you keep coming to us over and over again. Thanks be to God. Amen.